you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can be turning to Romans, Romans chapter 8, and then while you're turning there, uh, continue to remember what the ones that were mentioned for prayer, the sick uh, in the church, that the Lord might heal them up, and they might uh, be in the Lord's house, and pray that the Lord might meet with us this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 33. Romans 8, uh, verse 33, the Bible says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is God that justifies? Who is he that condemneth? Is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril of sword, and as, it, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter, nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for these people that have come this way this morning to hear from your open word. Lord God, we pray that you would meet with us, that you would make your word this morning a living word, that you'd make it something that we could grasp to, Lord, and that it would grasp to us. Uh, make us to understand and know who you are, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching this morning, the Lord being our helper, on because he loved me. Uh, you know, a lot of things is done today in a backwards fashion in the modern day. Uh, instead of marrying first and living together, they live first and then they marry. Uh, and a lot of times today, it is taught that if we love Jesus, he'll love us. Now, my newsflash up to you this morning is that you're incapable of love. Without, without Jesus intervening and loving you first, you can't love him. You know what? The reality of this is today, love is so distorted in the modern age that I don't know that we even know what love is anymore if Christ don't intervene. What a lot of people tag for love is nothing more than lust. And so, in the modern day, what we need to understand is what love is really about, and that it originates from the Father, it originates from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as Paul was writing to the church at Rome, and you can read Romans chapter 1, and understand, he knew this church had lots and lots of problems. He already seen the direction that they were going. All through chapter 1, he talks about idolatry, which is the very hallmark of the Catholic Church. He talks about sodomy and homosexuality, which is now the hallmark of the Catholic Church. Paul, by the divine spirit, saw the problems that they were having, and he was trying to address them. So he begins in verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now we get back to this, and that is the simple truth, that salvation is based on God and not on us. Now, every one of us, if we be honest, even this week have made mistakes have let the Lord down, and you know what? The world can lay charges against us, and in that sense, be just in doing it. But, because we are elect, Amen. because we're saved, it means nothing. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Not even the devil himself has the possibility or the ability to lay charges against us. Why? Because we stand redeemed. Why? Because we stand in grace Amen. and grace alone. And so we find then that as Paul is writing to the church 
subject wrong, he reminds us of he reminds us of our presence, uh, our position in Christ. Then he says this. This is the reason why. It's because it is God that justifies. Now, if we had to justify, if we had to justify ourselves, yes, there would be plenty to say. There would be plenty to to make us to make us guilty. But because of God, none can do it. Verse thirty four: Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Now, the condemning is not for us. The condemning is saying that they're wrong. Uh, uh, Christ condemns them. Christ put, says, no, that's not wrong. He's one of mine. He belongs to me. He's incapable of sin. He is mine. Amen. And that's a very, that's very hard thing for me, uh, for me to understand in the modern day. But I, all I simply know to do is to rejoice in it. Because you know what? Sometimes I don't even understand it myself. Uh, it's beyond my comprehension that the Lord would do this for us. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. What, what is the power in salvation this morning? The power is this, is that Christ rose again. That, that he came up from that, that grave, that death had no power over him. It had no dominion over him. And because of that, we can stand sure in salvation. You know what? Uh, oftentimes uh, people say, well, you Baptist, all you believe is once saved, always saved. Well, that's not all that I believe, but it's the chief cornerstone because you know what? It's built in Christ. The Bible says that Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's rejected by the Jews, but he belongs to us. And so, yes, I, I will have to say I'm guilty of that. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that day died, yea, rather that he is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God also maketh intercession for us. And that is why your salvation is secure. is because you have an intercessor. Every time you make a mistake. Every time you don't do what you should do. God just, uh, the Lord Jesus simply goes to his father and says he's one of mine. He's redeemed, he's under the blood. And that's all it takes. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, that answer is no one. No one shall separate us. Nothing that happens, nothing that occurs, nothing that transpires, not anything shall separate us from the love of Christ. You know, uh, in this day and in this time, uh, there are going to be things that come up that separates you from the people that you love. And you say, oh, no, no, that will never happen to us. Well, I can tell you one thing that will for sure, and that's death. Amen. Yeah. Right. Sister Joanne and Brother Marvin were married 39 plus years, but you know what finally separated them? It wasn't uh, Joanne being mad at Marvin or Marvin being mad at Joanne. Death stepped in and, and did its job. And so, yes, we certainly, but you know what? Even death does not separate us from the love of God. You know why? Because when we're finite, he's infinite. When we have a dying place, he has none. And so we as the Lord's people, we ought to rejoice in that this morning and understand and know of a surety that uh, we have this in him. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, we read these and we don't realize what Paul is changing, I mean, excuse me, saying to the church at Rome. Now, all the things we're fixing to go through is going to be an attempt of the devil to separate you from the love of Christ. To separate you from them. And as he was going through these lines of things and he will say, uh, and he'll say, shall tribulation and the answer is no. But listen, dear friend, tribulation will come. There will be that attempt. There will be the devil doing his thing as he always has done. Shall ye, shall ye surely die? Always question the authority and the dominion of God. Always has been his, always, always has been the devil's approach. Is question who God is and question what God 
says. That's his best motive that he can come up with. And, and so we find that to be true. Shall tribulation or distress? Now, we don't use distress in the modern day English, uh, excuse me, language. Drop the D and I, and what do we have? Stress. Now, we don't say, man, I'm distressed today. What do we say in the modern day? Man, I'm stressed out. You said that before, I have. Uh, you know, a lot of times I get three feet in the inside the nursing home, and I'm stressed out already. Does that separate you from the love of Christ? No. But it certainly can make you forget his love for you. Yeah, that's right. Because, like, man, you know what? You get involved in that. And, and like I said the other day, I went to work on Friday after my surgery for a few minutes. And before I realized it, I was already giving somebody a tour of the building. And you know what? Because work will sweep you away. Now, it's not, it's not a bad thing. We're cursed. Men, 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 we are cursed to do that. And you might as well buck up, buttercup, because we're going to be doing it till we're pu pushing up the daisies somewhere. But that, and that's just how it is. But let me say this. It can take something from you. Now, does it separate you from him? No. But you go long into the day and you haven't even thought about the goodness of God. And, th and, and that is the problem. So he, he lists these things that are part of our everyday trials and, and, and assures us that it's not going to separate us, but certainly it will cause problems. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril of sword? Now, the last ones are not pleasant, but again, you anticipate these problems. There is going to be persecution. There are going to be people that, that ask that question, who your God is. And ask you, why are you still doing this? What are you still up to? Don't you realize we live in the 21st century? Why are you giving your money to something that means nothing? They are going to question you that. The very, the very vice that the devil uses, you can't make it with giving that much money to the church. See, it's questioned all around you all the time. And so that becomes a difficulty. And as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he gives them a heads up that, listen... These things are going to uh, come to you. They're not going to separate you, but they are coming. And see, we like a smooth ride, don't we? We like, but there's no distresses. Well, listen, church, that doesn't exist. Now, there is always distresses. There are always problems. Why? Because the devil is extremely good. And so we see that that's not going to be, it's not going to be a smooth ride along the way. Verse 35, my favorite, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 36, as it is written, for, for, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are count, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now verse 36 makes it, clear, it says we are killed all the day long. Now, that's not pleasant reading, and, and you don't get, whoo, glory to God on that one. But you know what? It's just as true as my grace is sufficient. Yeah. It's just as true, and we don't like to hear it, but what, what he's saying, my love is not running out just because you just because you're true to the faith, even to the giving of your own life, does not mean that my, my love for you is run out. You know what? That may come. It, it may be a possibility for us as the modern day Christians. You know what? It, it, it could come around to Podunk, Dover, Tennessee. And if it does, all we can depend on is the grace of God will be sufficient in that time. And so what he was saying, I love you. I love you dearly, but
but these things are coming. So don't get discouraged. See, what do we think of as showing our love? Uh, the girls this morning got done a card and some kind of little paddle thing to decorate cake with. Uh, I don't know exactly what it was. Uh, but they wanted to show their love, right? But if Donna takes off tomorrow and is doing her rounds, is there any way they can prevent injury coming to Donna? No. Does that mean that they love her less? No. If he puts us in harm's way, does that mean he loves us less? No. But you will learn a lot about yourself in that. Mm -hmm. He ain't going to learn nothing because he already knows everything. But you'll, you'll, you'll learn some things about yourself. If you, don't, if you don't believe that, ask Peter. He learned a lot about himself. Did he not? And, and we do too. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Now, I want to I wanna just look at a couple of these because they thrill my heart. That death is not going to separate us from the love of God. Now, you have a lot of so-called denominations out here. I won't get too deep into them, but they all come from the great whore, the Catholic Church. They would say that David is out here sleeping. In that box. No. David's gone to eternity. And his body is out there in that box. And you see here. What the Lord says. That nothing can separate us. Not death. Right. Now if you slow. If you so sleep. Pharisee. Fairy tale is true. Then that verse is wrong. Is it not? But see. Immediate, but Paul says. <laughs> immediately to be with the Lord. And, and so we find then uh, one of the greatest treasures that, yes, they may take me down. Yes, they may blow my head off. Maybe they'll even do worse. But immediately when that time is over, I'll be at home with the Lord. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers. Now, principalities is the law and the powers is the enforcer. Them are the two I want to draw out to you this morning because this is the reality. The law is fixing to get against us. Amen. Now, whether you, whatever you think about Donald Trump this morning, it's none of my affair. But I will tell you this, dear friend. He's the only one that's kept religious freedom in this country for four more years. I don't know what will happen next year. But, you know, uh, when it, comes, it becomes illegal... To preach against sodomy. Troubles on the way. Absolutely. When it becomes illegal. To preach against the Ishmaelites. And that's what they are. The Arabs. All, all, all that whole group. Really go back to one defining characteristic. And that's this. Is they hate the God of the Bible. Yeah. And, and when we, when we. When that becomes illegal. Look out. Because see then. Uh, the principality, the law is against us, and then the powers, the cops, the politicians, listen, they're going to come after us. And you know what? God will still remain on the throne. He still do it well. Yes, we may die in it, but I'm persuaded nothing will keep us from him. See, a lot of people think that that promise is that things are going to be a smooth ride. No, the promise is eternal, an eternal promise. You're going to have some rough spots. And you know what? We as the Lord's people ought to just be able to, you know, instead of fussing about them, won't you be an example to your family and your neighbors that whenever the rough spots come, you still serve God. That's what Job did, was it not? And, and listen, Job went through a lot rougher spots than we did. Uh, verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, 35 speaks of the love of Jesus. 
in verse 39 speaks of the love of God, the great God Jehovah. And I want you to see that, that we see it's through or imputed by Christ Jesus. You know why God the Father loves you? Because Jesus loves you. Yeah. Uh, plus nothing, minus nothing. And you know, we have to believe this. If Christ don't love you, God hates you. Right? Uh, I, I think the verses concerning Esau and Jacob make that as, uh, as, as plain as it can be. And, and so we find then that this love of God, because he loved me, I'm different. Because he loved me, I can't endure. Because he loved me, I stand whole and unashamed this morning. Why? Because he loved me. Listen, to, next time you want to get on your soapbox of Baptist proudness, remember, it all comes down to this, because he loved me. Nothing more, nothing less, just because of the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we should glory in. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, every time you go to Ephesians, and you'll find that my Bible immediately, when you go to Ephesians, opens to Ephesians chapter 2, but that's cause, because that's where you hear the most preaching from. But Ephesians chapter number 3, verse 17 says this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, my question for you, first of all, if you want to if you want to take hold of, of the very fact that uh, Christ loves you, does he dwell in your heart? That's a question that has to be answered individually. That's a question that I can't answer for you, and certainly you can't answer for me. But as Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Do you believe that he can? Do you believe that he does? Because that's faith. Uh, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be, be, able, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breath of and length and depth and height, meaning of the Father's love. Now, I want you to see as Paul is writing to Ephesus, he uses things that we can understand, but still we have no idea of what this thing of the love of God is about. He says, by breath, which is what we call width. How wide is the love of God for you? And the only reason Paul said that, that's the only way we can get measurements in our head. But you know what? It exceeds the width of the ocean. It, it exceeds the size of this whole earth. It, it goes beyond the width of this universe. That's the glove that God uh, has for you. You know, uh, you know the reason that I believe the security of the believer, uh, salvation eternal, is because it depends on the love of God. And we can't even comprehend what that is. So it's just the breath, the width, the height of it. Uh, you remember as John saw New Jerusalem and, and he began to write about, he says, here, the angel said, here's a reed, measure it. And he came up with this unbelievable number. You know, the love of God exceeds New Jerusalem. It, it, it's deeper, it's higher, and it's better. And then the writer here, Paul, says, how deep is it? Well, I'm not exactly sure how deep it is, but I know it goes beyond hell. Because, see, that's where we ought to be, right? Uh, I fully believe, even to this day, that hell is in the belly of the earth. I believe the rich man's still there. I believe the punishment rages on. But I believe God's love goes deeper for you and for me and for all the redeemed. So that's how deep it goes. Uh, we try to understand what love is about, what motivates love, what generates love. You know what? The only way that you can really see that is how people treat you. Right? Now, I think about my sons and my daughters, and, and you can't look at me and say, Oh, man, Larry really loves his children. Because you know what? You can't see love. But you can see what I do for them. Now I'm not a rich man and never will be. But what little bit I have, you know what? I'm going to let my children go hungry. 
I'm not let my grandchildren go hungry. And you know why? Because I love them. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you push and uh, now I'm past 50. Still today, if Adam says, Dad, I need, I need some help getting my gutters cleaned out. I'll be up there. I may hobble up the ladder, but I'll, I'll, I'll get up there. You know why? Because that love drives you to do that. And it's the very same way with the love that Jesus Christ has for us. It, dro it drove him to the cross of Calvary. It drove him to spill out his life's blood on my behalf. It drove him to do that. And you know, at least in the flesh, I've never even met the man. But I know that he loved me because what he did. Not what, what he said, but what he did. And that's how we can understand love better. So as Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, he said, these are the indications of the love of God to you. These, this is what love looks like. Verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth, not, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, do you, do you know the love of Christ? Do you understand the love of Christ? And if you don't, and you know what? I'm going to have to say this and, and throw it out there. I don't really fully know the love of Christ. And if you'd be honest with me, you don't know either. But I know if we understand the love of Christ, to some extent, we'll understand the fullness of God. You know, everybody was, everybody's always said now, you know, uh, you know, Baptists are afraid to speak of the Holy Ghost. We've preached on that for two years. But you know who I understand less than the Holy Ghost? God. I, I, I think I understand him less. Uh, something that's infinite, it always has been, and is pure and holy infinitely. That's not something mankind can get a hold of. And, and, and so I, I have to say this, that if I want to get in a situation where I understand him better, knowing about the love of Christ and the love of God, but the love of Christ we can see on the cross of Calvary, the love of Christ we can see when he called the dead back to life, the love of Christ we can see as he goes walking on the water to prove that, yes, in fact, I am God. That love we can see all through this book. That, and, and if we began to understand even a little a mustard seed of that, then you might begin to see the love of God. The love of God is incredible, and, and, and we should desire to know that better. And you know, flip, flipping through the pages and always writing on John, John 3, 16, understand the love of God. Desire it more than anything else, more than honeycomb, more than milk, that you might understand the very love of God. That's what we need in the modern day. And when we get that, the Lord will bless us greatly. Verse 20. And now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, to do exceeding abundantly beloved, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that, according to the power that worketh in us. Now, what do you believe God can do? What do you believe God can do? Uh, do you believe He can raise the dead? I do. Do we limit that to the end of Christ's ministry? Don't we? I mean, if you be honest, wouldn't you say, well, that was, you know, I heard this all the time when I was a kid. Well, that was in the Bible days. Well, that's my recollection. We're living in the Bible days, right? So, yes, he can, most certainly. If it was the will of God, the dead can rise even in this modern church age. It's up to God. Yeah. He's able that ought to be enough to make you love him. <laughs> Just to see how powerful he is. Just to see his ability. <clears throat> Can he speak something out of nothing? Well, he did at least one time that I know of. Right? Now, 
this, this little building that we meet in, and I, I love to think about the miraculous things that God did, went into, uh, but we built it, you know, we, we put in the gut labor. But let me ask you this. Could God create a building in and of himself? True. Right? Come back one day and it all be finished. That, that's outside man's comprehension, is it not? But I know God can do it. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, what we need to begin to understand and know, that is the type of person that we love. That is the one that has no infallibility, no limit to who he is. That is the one we are to love. Verse 21, And unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And so we are to give him the great glory. Uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now, uh, do, do you know what constrain means? It means to be tied up with strains. The love of Christ constraineth us. It puts you in bondage. Yeah. Now, that's not a real pleasant thought, is it? Well, it's not at first. But think about the commitment you made to your wife or your husband. Does that not constrain you? Limit you to some things? Yeah. I promise to take care of Donna the rest of her life. The day that I married her. And to what feeble ability that I have, I tried to do it. I promised that constraining that I wouldn't look for another woman, that I'd be faithful to her. And I've done that. By the grace of God, I've done that. You see, so love does constrain, does it not? It, it, it limits you to some point. If you say, I love this person, you do for them things that constrain your other behavior, right? Uh, and that's certainly the way it ought to be, is that our love for Christ causes you to serve them, Him, more than anybody else. That's what constraineth us, limits us when we love. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge, and if one died for all, then all were dead. So they're all going to hell. You know what? Everybody always asks me, well, Brother Larry, if I believe what you believe, what about them little people in Ethiopia that have never had uh, heard of Christ? Are they going to hell? Yes. Do I understand it? No, but I will go with what the Bible says. And if they've not heard of Christ, and they've not had, had, had been converted, yes, they're going to hell. And I know somehow, I might not see it, but in the wisdom of God, that's just and right. And you know what? All you can do is say, Amen! And go with what God says. And so we find then that this limitation, this thing to serving God, the love of God makes us love Him, makes us serve Him. Verse 16, uh, wherefore, henceforth, know we, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now, I want you to notice two things. In verse 16, Paul refers to the instance that made him an apostle. Uh, the, the office, the apostolic office of the church is dead. Because no one has seen Christ in the flesh. But we find that Paul did on the road to Damascus. And it made him an eligible apostle. Although born out of time. And I want you to see that also. He says I'm not going to see him no more. Do you stop loving people. When you don't see them anymore. I don't. Do you? 
I love Judy just like the day she left. I haven't seen her in almost eight years. Right? So was Paul going to stop loving Christ because he wasn't seeing him? I've never seen Christ and I love him dearly. I don't know what he'll look like. I know he ain't going to be no long-haired hippie. I do know that. I don't know what he'll be like, but I know that I'll love him. He's not going to be white like me. I know that. He's going to be a shade or two darker. And you know what? I'm going to still love him. His, heart, his hair is probably going to be blacker than mine. If he truly presents himself in what most Jews look like. But I'm going to still love him. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so it has to exceed that. Uh, again, one of our problems is, one of our problems here in America is that we equate love to lust. And, and, and that is not the way it, it, it is at all, particularly with the love of God. They, you, you, love, <laughs> you love them for who they are. You love them for the work that's accomplished. Verse 17, uh, therefore, therefore, if, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 19, to the wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, we are now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled unto God. Now, I ask you this, and only you can answer this for me. Are you an ambassador of Christ? Do you speak of Christ? Do you present this Christ? Do people say, oh yes, that man must have been a Christian. I spent time with him. You, you, you know, you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ met those two, uh, two uh, men on the Emmaus Road? And they were sitting there and talking about Christ and talking about this and talking about that. And after Christ left, you know what they said? Did, he, did not our hearts burn within us? That's a type of love. You, you know how you can tell somebody's been with Christ? Your heart will burn with them. It'll manifest. And you know what? Uh, if it's not there, it's just not there. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we ought to rejoice when we time to time find those individuals along the way. And listen, they may not necessarily believe exactly what they do. They may not be five pointers. They may not even be Baptist people. But when your heart burns with them, that's a, love, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Are you an ambassador for Christ? Do you speak of him? Verse 21. For he hath made... Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So that's what the love of God does for us. Last place, Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Second Thessalonians chapter two, and beginning in verse thirteen. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Beginning in verse 13, the Bible says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Now we get back to our bound, our binds, our slavery. You know, uh, we uh, sometimes lose, lose the, the translation of that word as well. Uh, I remember when I was a boy, my grandmother and my mother said, well, it's bound to happen one day. And what they really meant, it was likely to happen. Because it wasn't bound to happen, because if it was bound to happen, you know what? It would happen for sure. When, when, when you are bound, it is going, it, it, it is a surety. And, and so as Paul is ending uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, ending the second Thessalonican letter, he, he says to them, he uh, uh, 
says to them in verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of God, because God hath, hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in, uh, of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Don't give. Don't move. Keep where you're at. Hold the line. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions that you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. In other words, don't you let one, one minuscule piece of the word of God go. You keep it. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, you know why uh, I don't think we ought to uh, be allowing worldly things into this building is because you got to hold to it, right? You know, after two thousand years, why I believe there's one garment for a man and another garment for a woman is because he told me to hold to it, right? You know why I believe that it isn't necessary even to have a building? Because he never said it was. Amen. Hold to it. You know, these little bitty tiny churches, and I, I knew one in Granite City that met in the pastor's apartment for I know at least 20 years, and finally the Lord took him on to be with him. And you know what? I believe it was just as much as a church as New Testament Baptist churches today. Uh, they just didn't have a place to meet. Well, they had a place to meet. It just wouldn't be what we thought. Remember, again, watch this finite money to get you into trouble. And, and, and so we, we as the Lord's people, we ought to rejoice in the very love that he's given us each and every day. Verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold to the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. So what does security of the believer flow from? The love of God. And the love of God is never ending. The love of God is ever present. And therefore you have to come to the conclusion the same is true with salvation. Because listen, he didn't save you because you asked him to. He didn't save you from the fires of hell. He saved you to serve him and because of his own grace. Plus nothing, minus nothing, don't add nothing to it. And so then we as the Lord's people, we ought to be able and glad to say, because he loved me. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Verse 17. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. If this is a com not a comfort to you, the comfort of the love of God, the comfort of, of Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know what else could be. 